NZR Aero Sports, Icarus Canopies, now Gyro. That's right, we've rebranded, and Gyro is our next generation. It honours our founder, as that's the name we knew him by, but Gyro also marks the start of a new chapter. And not to be biased, but it's going to be fucking epic. Long story short, we're more us than ever. So if you're new to the sport, or even a Sky God Ninja Turtle, welcome. I think our valiant leader Lucy, Gyro's daughter, Says it best. And we still got that fuck your attitude. <laughs> Rebrand! Woo! Rebrand woo indeed, Lucy. Anyway, head over to gyro.com for more info and get amongst your legends. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Hey gang, so... I got a new book out. It's called The Upside of Fear, and it's exactly what you think it's about. It's about the good side of, well, getting scared. In it, we talk not only about the science and biology behind fear, but the psychology as well. And it's not just coming from me. It's coming from some of the best in the sport. Omar Alhijalan, Jeff Provenzano, Maxine Tate, and so many more have contributed their sometimes terrifying stories to the book to help you overcome your fear. So head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com. You're going to find the link to the book there as well as the other books. It's available in ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook right now. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another edition of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast and another friendly face. It's been a couple of years since we've caught up, but let's do it again. Who the fuck are you, and what do you do? Hey, my name is Billy Sharman. I um, run a drop zone, and we operate a PAC 750 here in South Africa. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an adventure the last few years, <laughs> and uh, to say the least, <laughs> but um, yeah, we've come a long way. We we started off, started off in skydiving, skydiving with old Uncle Ray Farrell. You know, yeah, and then we moved to Dubai. I was in Dubai for uh, about about almost nine years, and then uh, made a stupid, crazy decision to to take over and run a drop zone in South Africa. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what. I've had a few DZOs on now. I've had Ray on. I've had uh, Sherry Butcher, who runs Air Ohio, and and a few others. And you're all fucking mental, man. You're fucking telling me, bro. I mean, of all the things, you know, I mean, you've you've definitely gone hard in the paint 
for a lot of years, you know, I mean, between uh, working and swooping and all the traveling and stuff that you've done, but buying a drop zone. Oof. Yeah, I thought it was a smart idea in the beginning, but uh, <laughs> it ended up not being as easy as I thought it would be. <laughs> and it, uh, yeah, we put uh, our time in and I think we've, we've de definitely come a, come a long way since I was so wet behind the ears with it, you know? Ah, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get too into, uh, um, the mental breakdown, uh, in progress for being a DZO, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, um, how you got started. Just remind everybody that hasn't heard, uh, you and I talk before how you got started in skydiving. And then of course, how we ended up meeting. Yeah. My, my, uh, my mother was an old school skydiver. She was California state champion in the uh, silent accuracy. And I think in the early seventies, and, you know, when I reached the age of about, you know, 16, I used to look at the aircraft as we're flying around, you know, flying in 210s or 182s or whatever. And uh, I used to look at the window going, my mother is fucking mental to jump out of the plane. <laughs> right? I thought she was crazy. And then one day, you know, one day my cousin was in America, was in California. And uh, he said, why don't we go skydiving? And I, I was supposed to go the year before with my father and with him. And I finally, I said, funny, I said, fuck it. Let's, let's go try it. And, uh, you know, one, one tandem led into the, the second tandem the same day. And then about a week later, I started uh, AFF. And then about a month later, I I'd finished my 25 jumps. And then I threw all my money at the sport for the next thousand jumps, which probably took me just over a year. Wow. And then oh my god, about a year and three months. And then and then I was broke. <laughs> and I had no more money. <laughs> so I had to learn how to pay for my my addiction. Uh so I became a packer, became a, a, a rigger, and then was on the on my hands and knees for quite a few years Oof. working for all, all the ray. Um and uh yeah, from then it was pretty much downhill, you know. Became a tunnel <laughs> instructor in Arizona. <laughs> I love that uh, looking back on things right now, the highlight of your career was being a Packer for Ray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mean, I, he, did, he did one time give me a free jump. I can remember we were doing, uh, we were doing this 18,000 uh, 18, feet jumps. And I uh, came into the, into the loft and into the packing mat the one day and said, uh, you want to go on this load? I said, yeah, yeah, for sure. He says, grab your shit. Let's go, boy. <laughs> so I grabbed my stuff and jumped on the load. I think they let me out at like, what, 14, 15. I think they were going to 20,000 feet. I forget. Mm. But uh, I got out higher than I ever got out before in my life. Did a, the longest solo of my life. Um, and I just was like, is this ever going to end? Yeah. I just kept falling and falling. <laughs> They're brutal, right? I mean, uh, um, Ray was real big on that because uh, we did the 18,000 foot tandems out there. And yeah. I, I mean, I suppose as a baby skydiver, I would have thought that was the coolest thing in the world. But as a tandem instructor, you'd look at the load sheet and see that you had an 18,000 foot tandem and you're like, motherfucker, man, because you run out of shit to do after the first 30 uh, seconds. Oh, uh, Especially if you're doing a solo, you know. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> From that kind of height? No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ray was one of the first to really start pumping up the uh, the altitude because he does, or had, when he's still at Skydance, he was doing proper high altitude shit. I think they were doing 30,000 footers out there. Yeah. Man, oh man. Yeah. Oxygen masks, all that stuff. Over Skydance of all places. And I didn't know that place fucking existed until 2005. And I grew up 20 minutes from there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, I was the same way I was living in Vacaville. And that's 10, 15 minutes from there. So and I didn't I, know until I got to know, because I mean, obviously you you grew up out that way, but you were born and raised in South Africa. So how the hell do you end up in Vacaville? <laughs> so my father was an aircraft mechanic and he couldn't stand having a boss. And he worked for Delta, he worked for United. And then uh, he had his own his own uh, aircraft mechanic shop in South Africa. So when we moved back, when we moved to California, it took us a while before my father finally found his footing. I mean, we were living in, in Danville and San Ramon there for a while. Oh, wow. And my dad was commuting all the time. 
and he would lose his shit in the traffic. You know, he wasn't a very patient man <laughs> sitting in traffic. <laughs> it was hilarious. So, so um, you know, eventually my dad found Vacaville and uh, my mother was selling aircraft. I mean, my mother was selling uh, African furniture. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I mean, the the funny thing is, I mean, I, I say Vacaville like I'm talking shit about it, but it was actually a cool little town. It was just a teeny place in between San Francisco and Sacramento. Yeah, you know, when I was growing up there, we, they were, we, had, we had big problems with gangs and stuff. Mm. Yeah. And so my parents decided that they were like, they said to me, sorry, boy, but uh, you're not going to be staying in, in California anymore. We're going to put you in boarding school in South Africa. So they put me in a in a Boeing 747, and I flew to Amsterdam, and I met I met one of my friend, my mother's friend's friend, picked me up at the airport, took me to the house. I mean, I was only twelve at the time, mm. you know? and then uh, spent the night there. The next day, I got to drive on the autobahn, which I thought was fucking rad. We were doing like one hundred and sixty, <laughs> was rad, it was rad. <laughs> and then, uh, sorry, one hundred and sixty kilometers an hour, not not it's miles. Still fast, <laughs> still fast, yeah. And then, uh, you know, they put me in another airplane and I flew back to, to down South Africa. And then I, I saw one of my mother, my father's friends picked me up there. I spent a couple of nights there and then they put me in my, one of my dad's buddies picked me up in his, in his, uh, in his Bonanza, the Baron Bonanza. And, uh, he took me to Kimberley and just dropped me off, said bye. And I was 12 years old, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> quite the adventure. From from uh, an American's perspective, that certainly wasn't particularly world. Still, I'm not terribly worldly about the continent of Africa. You tell me you're sending someone from California to Africa for safety reasons doesn't make sense in my head. Right? Well, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. But my <laughs> fa- my father wanted me to get a proper education. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah for but, sure. Well, you know, I, the, the, I, at that time, a California education was not that great. Oh, tell me about it, dude. I'm the product of of a California public education. And, and uh, you know, I, I sit here in Finland uh, struggling with every other language because, you know, the United States didn't teach me any other languages. And I work with a bunch of skydivers that are from all around the world. And I, I think I'm the only one that only speaks one language. You know, everybody <laughs> else is multi, you know, multilingual. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. So you 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 crank out a thousand jumps in basically your first less than a year and a half which is an insane amount of jumps to yeah. start out with yeah. your parents kind of i mean obviously your mom was a championship skydiver so what did she think though when you're dumping all your money into jumping like a wild man well they were they thought not too highly of me um you know i was i, I was working as a, i was setting tile and after that, after I spent after all this money that I'd made, I'd, I had to do something. <laughs> you know? You know, I remember one day I was living in Dubai and my mom and dad came to visit me. They were going to Sri Lanka at the time. And uh, my father pulled me around the side and said, listen, Billy, you need to get a real job now. Sure. And I said, and he says, no, no, you must find something real to do. So we got home that night and I took out my paycheck and I said, dad, is this, is this okay? He turned around and said, shook my hand and said, my boy, you're doing a good job. You keep doing it. <laughs> you know, it's right, when, especially with Dubai, because uh, that was I, I, I don't know if it's still as unusual as it used to be, but that was like the top of the pyramid. If you made it to Dubai, you were you were banking fat cash and living well. Yeah. yeah. Now, how did Dubai come about for you? Well, um, I got a phone call one day from. Uh, Jeffro, oh Jeffro, where's oh. Jeffro? Um, and he said to me, he offered me. He said to me, "Do you do you want to go and work in, in Abu Dhabi?" And I said, "Yeah, okay. Why not? When do I start?" And they said to me, "Oh no, you start in five days." So at the time, I was working for West Harbor. Um, I just after he passed, I that didn't really have much to do, you know. So yeah, after at West, um, and so I said, "Yeah, I'll go." I said five days, and I went, holy fuck. So I packed all my shit up and disappeared to Abu Dhabi. And I was there with Timmy, Timmy McMaster, Jason Payne. Um, nice, nice. Stefan Lip was there. So there are a lot of, lot of <laughs> massive names in the sport, you know. Check that out. Look at that. 
Still got it after all these years. <laughs> so yeah. since it's just audio, I just pulled out a, um, a, a pin for Wes's memorial. Wes was a hell of a guy. He was a trip. Yeah. <laughs> he was a trip. And I mean, what an operation to be jumping at. Cause uh, I flew up there for him in Ray's pack a couple of times and it was, what was the airport it was in? Minden. Yeah, that's right. Minden, Nevada. And uh, um, on the special loads, you guys had land on South Lake in Lake Tahoe, which for anybody that's never been to Lake Tahoe, holy fuck, one of the most beautiful spots in the world. And then add to that, jumping out of an airplane over the top of it is ridiculous. Yeah. You, you had a few interesting jumps over the uh, lake, didn't you? I don't know if we're going to bring this up. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we did a lake load. Landed the lake, we jumped in the car, drove to the airport, took off, and we only got 10,000 feet. But, you know, I was super happy and enjoying myself, and we were tracking, and then we tracked off. And I see people, I'm, I'm on my back, and I just see people start pitching. And as I roll over, I just see the ground is it's massive. I pitched my main out, it took it, it took it open on heading, old uh, VX, what a great canopy that was. And uh, turned left over the over this uh, fence on my rears, and had you know these big um, sprinklers for farm sprinklers. Yep. I punched out over that, and thank goodness that the ground had just been watered down, and I landed in the biggest mud pit. <laughs> but lit, <literally laughs> I was open so low, I had no no time to think. Oof. So, yeah, and I'd just taken my cypress out and sent it in for. Uh, to get to get fixed, not fixed, but to get um, recalibrated after the four year. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of lucky I did because when I looked at the, I looked at the video. You see my my hand come up as all over my back, and I pitched around about seven hundred and eight hundred feet. Holy so shit! I totally would have had a, a cypress fire on my back. Yeah, yeah, you would have. No bueno. Well, I mean, hey, uh, we're still here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people so say. Fuck Cypress, fuck Vigil, whatever. Have someone on your back. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So I interrupted your story because I couldn't pass on that one. But uh, um, so Jeff Rowe gets a hold of you and off to Abu Dhabi in five days. Yes. So I arrive in, in Abu Dhabi and I meet this, there's got this guy. I mean, obviously, Timmy McMaster was there. We, we saw each other in line. And, uh, and this guy, Evgeny, uh, Evgeny, picks us up. And, and uh, Tim and I are looking at each other going, this ration, what is going on here? And we drive through the night because it's landed at night, and we're driving on this long road from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. And Tim and I think, yes, are we are we being assassinated out here, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> and Evgeny, what are the sweetest men you'll ever meet in your life? What a great guy. Yep. Uh, yeah. So we arrived there, and then we were we were there for about a year, almost a year and a half. Wow. I before, mean, before before. Uh, before Omar Hedgelon, another legend. Um, he uh, he called us the one day and said, "Listen, you guys want to come fly in the Sheikh's tunnel?" So, of course, we said, "Yeah, absolutely." So then the Sheikh came up to us and you know said to us, "If you do, you guys want to come and work by us?" And I said, "Yeah, absolutely." So the next week, I handed him my resignation at uh, at Sky at um, Spacewalk. Took a holiday in South Africa for for a month and a half, and then I was in in Dubai. As a tunnel instructor. I mean, that was the big, I mean, it wasn't even the, that was the golden age. That was, yeah. that, that was when everything was going on. Cause I mean, that tunnel became um, world famous quite quickly just because of the talent that it was cranking out. Yeah. I mean, damn. And this the time before the desert drops was open. And it was also before the first DIPC. Yeah. It was, no, we were at the very, very, very beginning. Yeah. And you know, I count my blessings for it every time. I had such an amazing time. Oh, yeah. Because I met, met so many amazing people. But uh, just count my blessings every time that I got, was able to spend so much time there. Sure. Now, you began in the tunnel, but I mean, quite quickly, um, everything really kind of took off um, with the palm drop zone. And then it seemed like almost overnight um mock tomb and and all these amazing teams started popping up all over the place and then you ended up on the swoop team yes i mean how yeah. fucking cool is that how did that happen 
Well, you know, Maha was involved and we started off just as the fuzzest guy. Um, we were the, really the first two guys that were competing for Fazar. Mm. And, you know, we, we, they really looked after us. They really took care of us. They sent us all over the world, you know, and then, and then we were, and then, and then the boss came to us and said, listen, um, you should, uh, we should make a, a, a swoop team. And just as this was starting to happen, we'd also been talking uh, with um, JT about it, you know. And so then with the four of us, we went, the, five, the four of us, yeah, went up to Norway. Um, and then that's unfortunately when that all went down for, for, for JT, you know. Sure. It was, um, it was a very, very tough time in my life. Mm. You know, one of my, another one of my close friends, but it was actually saw him in, you know, under canopy flying into into a tree and it was very um yeah it was a very difficult time for for myself sure. and boys you know sure well i mean um for a huge portion of the skydiving community i mean there were jt stickers ever there still are jt stickers out there all over the place yes absolutely yeah man yeah for sure a lot of fun and funny shit happened in that time as well actually you would have been around um uh it was well before my time, but I've heard the story come down over and over <laughs> when Maha uh, made a bet <laughs> yeah. with Sheikh Hamdan um, <laughs> about the canopy. If you know that story, please tell it. Yes. So that, that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maha, we had a, we had a conversation and Maha said to the boss said, listen, there's no ways you can get a canopy from Florida, here, made, logoed, everything within one week. So he said to him, if he said to the boss, if you can, I will do the chicky 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 dance. And then the boss said, if if you if you, if you can't, I mean if you if you do do it, then uh, I'm going to take you to um, the Dubai Mall and you're going to do the chicky chicky dance in the Dubai Mall in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, I think that's when he started to the Maha started to stress. So I, I got a phone call about three, four days later that uh somebody had grabbed Maha's rig, took it to the farm, they called me up, put put it together, put um hook it up, put it into his rig, and then let's go. And I still I remember Maha saying, you know, he jumped out the plane, they called him to the farm, said, No, don't worry, we've got your rig there, we're just gonna go jump into the drop zone. And um <laughs> and so they they got on the plane they flew over the drop zone they jumped and as you as they were doing that they got the whole drop zone out there to watch this chicky chicky dance <laughs> <laughs> and i remember Ma telling me you know open the parish i looked up and he went shiza <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> then he comes in the land and we all sitting there all of us are sitting there and uh he gets down he had to put on a this little little dance outfit <laughs> like a hula hula outfit <laughs> and that's the boss said, said the boss said you know i'm not gonna do the i'm not gonna make you do it out in the in the at the mall you can just do it yeah and this and fuad still has video i can tell you right now fuad still has the video oh. of Ma doing the chicky chicky dance i would love to see that oh my god uh, that... Ma, if you're listening us or fuad if you're listening send us the chicky chicky dance come on please please i'll get <laughs> so much mileage out of that for the podcast <laughs> I mean, I remember being told that story and Maha making the bet about having the canopy made and, you know, not knowing anything about it. And then all of a sudden the canopy he didn't think could ever be made is in a sniveling above his head. Yes. Which is just fucking mental. But I mean, Boss was pretty infamous for his practical jokes, though, wasn't he? Yes, for sure. I mean, I got it's there kind of. At the okay. end of that, you know, I mean, I only saw very, very little bit of that and, and um, a few trips that we had done. But uh, um, I heard all the stories because they're just fucking fantastic stories. Yeah, they're phenomenal. Oh, man. So you were nine years in Dubai. That's a long run. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was there 10. So um, same, same. That's that's a long time in that spot, especially for skydivers that bounce around notoriously. Although you got to travel a lot with the team, didn't you? Yeah, we traveled all over Norway, Sweden, um, Switzerland. We went to uh, obviously all over America. We went to South America, 
all over Europe, Russia. I went to Russia tw- uh, twice then. I've been there tw- two more times since. Wow. And yeah, it's, you know, the privilege that I was given to go all over the world yeah. was probably the best, one of the best parts of my life, eh, for sure. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I'll tell you what, it's funny because um, when you're in the middle of it, especially at the end of a nine or 10 year run, you get a bit burned out. And and uh, so when I finally um, resigned and left Dubai, I was I was pretty fried. But the further away I get from it, the more the little bullshit that used to bother me on a daily basis just disappears. And all I remember is this ridiculously cool shit that I got to do. Yeah. I mean, it's it was such a privilege, especially, too, because I got to, you know, um, you know, get to meet so many new friends and see so many old friends. Because I remember I didn't know that you were out there. I didn't know a lot of people were out there when I took the job because it was the same with me. I got the job offer. And the next thing you know, I'm on a plane to Dubai. You know, <laughs> I mean, it it was it was pretty much that quick. And I had to quit an airline and all that shit. Um, so. It, it, that was a trip as well. But I mean, I got to see so many people that I hadn't seen in forever. And it was just, it was the greatest thing. Didn't you have to travel to go pick up airplanes and bring them back? Yeah, actually, the, the best trip I got to take um, was actually with uh, one of our other pilots, Ty. We had to take Jump 5 um, to Switzerland and then bring it back. And that was fucking fantastic because we flew, you know, over Oman, over Saudi Arabia, over the... Uh, um, over Egypt and then over um, all the way to uh, uh, Greece, stayed overnight in Greece, then over Italy, over the Alps and into Switzerland. And then coming back, we ran into a a monster headwind. So we had to stop off in Egypt and got to go see the fucking pyramids because I just happened to be in Egypt in Cairo. It was fucking ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah, man. You know, it's again, it's one of those stories that uh, I, I find myself... Because here in in Finland and with my wife's friends, none of them are jumpers and none of them know anything about Dubai. And so I find myself telling stories that anybody from Dubai is like, oh, that must have been cool. But everybody else, you can see that look in their eyes that they're listening to you tell this story going, this motherfucker is so full of shit. No way. (laughs) No way is any of this shit true. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's just how that time was. It was, yeah, you know, I think, I think a lot of people don't, they don't, they don't think what we did was, 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 was normal. I mean, it wasn't really normal, but it became in the norm for us. Yeah. You know, doing all the stuff that we were doing because it was our jobs. Yeah. You know, those were our jobs. Those are what we were, we were paid to do and to make sure that, you know, it, uh, the name was out there and that, that we were being, that we were respecting everything that was, that we were doing, you know? Sure. Well, and it was also, um, Skydive Dubai had made such a name for itself, not just in the sport, but outside the sport. So, yeah. I mean, you'd remember, it seemed like every other day there was some celebrity coming through to do a tandem. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was still cool, but it wasn't unusual to, you know, be flying a load with fucking Will Smith in the back or Christina Rodriguez, or I spent a, a week with Tom Cruise out in the desert when he was doing his stunt stuff. And that was cool, but it wasn't like, oh my God, it was a, yeah, no, that was, that was cool. But anywhere yeah, else. We were, we were mingling with a lot of, lot of big names, you know? Yes, for sure. So it became operations normal for us. Well, not to mention, I mean, it's a very unusual situation to find yourself in sitting and chatting with the next leader of Dubai. Yeah. Right. It's strange. Like yeah. um, when uh, I'm sure you, I think you were there um, when we went to uh, um, Sheikh Rashid's memorial. Mm, uh, yes. That yes. was one of the strangest experiences of my entire life. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, it was just, that was Dubai. Yeah. What a trip. Yeah, so what a trip. Your nine years in Dubai wraps up and you decide you're going to go back to South Africa and buy a drop zone. Pretty much. Let's get into it. Pretty much. Well, Pete Lawson had had on the drop zone for quite a while and he wanted out. And, you know, my father always told me you have to move forward. You can't ever move backwards. So my natural progression was to say, fuck it, let's try try running a drop zone. Yeah. So we, we started the drop zone. We, we took over the drop zone. It took us about 
two or three years before um before we completely had taken over the drop zone completely because I slash that Peter's a partner, you know. Mm. And he's a great guy. Pete's a great guy. And uh but the but the end game was to operate it by ourselves and not need other people. Sure. So we did that and uh yeah, nine years after that, what no? You're looking at seven and a half years, eight years later. Mm. You know, we've we put we put two world championships, two championships together, one in 2019, and then the last one this year. And uh, yeah, we've just been getting we've been getting better and better and better. You know, it's been it was difficult through COVID, but uh, overall, the drop zones, you know, had us definitely had its ups and downs. Sure. But uh, it's something which we've, we've we've done, and we can be very proud of what we've done over the past few years. Oh hell yeah! Well, and especially um, just taking the competitions into uh, into consideration, you have multiple world records being set at your place. Yes. Yeah. Well, they we set them there, and then they come around the corner, and they they break the we we smash the speed the world record, and now they just smash it again. It's crazy. It all it? Only smashed it in Dubai. Crazy, yeah. It's so part of it's uh, you guys are at elevation. Like, how high are you? At forty two hundred feet. Okay, so you got a little elevation going, which definitely but helps. The problem, the, the, but the but the real the real catcher is you can get density altitude of up six seven thousand feet. Jesus. Yeah. You know. Jesus. So when you when you've got those kind of conditions, uh, especially when you're on the cutting edge with the swoop competitions that you're doing, are these guys coming out and giving themselves a ton of lead time to train? Because that's a whole different you know, kind of air. I said that before. I said it before on the 2019 World Championships. I tried to push people in the right way, but you get people that just you know don't have enough training jumps, and it's just sure. very difficult. For that person, for those people, because one, you're going faster. Second, you need to turn higher. The recovery recovery is a lot longer. Yeah. No, and you're just gaining speed. So it's if you are, if I could say one thing to Swoop is, if you're going to go to competition, show up early, try and get all the conditions, have that downwind distance, have that headwind distance, have the downwind speed, you know, have the downwind accuracy. I know how many people have hurt themselves. You know, especially 2019, I said to everybody, I said, I'm, I'm running downwind uh, accuracy. I'm not doing that. And they ended up having downwind accuracy in the beginning of, of accuracy, the, on the first day. And then we got so many complaints that we changed the discipline. And then on the last day of the competition, guess what? Downwind accuracy. There's nothing we could do, right? It's the last few days. So people, if you go to, if you go to a swoop competition, Train a lot, listen to the locals, and uh, and you'll have a much safer, much better competition. Yeah, for sure. Which I mean, not only makes their competition better, but it's a, a hell of a lot better for your operation as well, because you don't want to be known as a place that bends people. So much rather keep them safe. Yeah. So, what was the uh, was it the the competition that brought Ray out to you? No, Ray came out for a, a boogie that. Uh, well, myself and Richie Grimm put on. Nice. Yeah. You know, so I had an idea for a boogie, and uh, and I called old Rich up, and I said, Richie, this is my idea. He said, it sounds it sounds amazing. It sounds like you can pull it off. So we definitely had our time um, organizing it. Hands down, Richie Grimm is a hero because he brought the people that that you know he brought yeah. all the people. Yeah. I mean, he's got he's got a a list a mile and a half long of, of people that can come to the tsunami skydivers. You know? Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah, we did, we, we jumped at Shamwari. We were supposed to jump in Cape town, but the weather was just not conducive to it. Mm. You know, and uh, I did a test jump and we had a 25 knot wind blowing right down the landing area. I got out, you know, almost five miles away. Huh. You know, <laughs> I got out of that, like a, a, a one pedal one. 2.2 pro um after and uh came in the land and was like oh you see no it's fine we can land here no problems but you guys are jumping 170s 190s yeah. 150s these cannabis gonna be going backwards no we can handle it and richie and i looked at each other and went there's no ways 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we all hung out at, at a winery. And then a couple of days later, we went, went to the, this beach town um, called Plattenberg Bay. And we were supposed to do an entire day of jumping on the beach. But um, unfortunately, there was raining and windy and raining, low clouds. We couldn't even get the aircraft in oh. to, to, be able to operate there because of the low clouds, the rain. And uh, we had this beautiful beach set up. There was a restaurant on the beach. You would r- walk off the beach into the restaurant, get your pack jobs. And ca- that was, the, that was the, the dream, right? Sure. And unfortunately, we just didn't have good enough weather. But then we went to this five-star lodge. And I think Richie and I were the first people to ever rent the entire game farm. We had 121 people there. We were the first group, the first people to rent the entire game farm. They've got six lodges hmm. on uh, on their on their game farm, and uh, you know it's it's it, uh, it was unbelievable. We had two two pretty good days. The, the the last day of jumping was amazing. The day before we were on and off. I think we did we did 12, 15, 16 loads. This is the, the on the third day of while we were there. And then on the on the fourth day, we did I think another sixteen loads. Nice, if I remember correctly. And uh, you know, had a massive party in that night, and everybody was was driving around in uh, in in game drive vehicles. We were watching. There was a time where we couldn't operate because we were right there with lying in the in the landing area. You know, <laughs> and then there was one time where there was a herd of elephants. We're walking on the other side, and we had to get the gyro, gyrocopter out to scare, to chase the whole herd away from the landing area. Amazing! So it was very, it was very interesting. Well, that was but, like uh, um, when I went out to uh, uh, to Kenya to help Zane about uh, and train uh, one of her pilots, and I'm standing there waiting for loads to come uh, on uh, Vapingo Ridge, and this giraffe wanders over and starts licking me, like. <laughs> fucking what <laughs> yeah just, now you're talking shit and now all there everybody's like now now you're talking shit i have video i'll post it <laughs> yeah. i mean i believe you i i've seen it i believe you yep but all yep. your viewers at home are like yeah this fucking guy oh, of course <laughs> well they're they're already convinced i'm full of shit anyway so it's fine <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, um, Rich Grimm told me um, when I had him on, um, he's like, that's the greatest part about um, a proper, well-thought-out destination boogie is that even if the jumping isn't quite what you had hoped, the destination itself is already fucking amazing, and you're there with a bunch of skydivers. Yeah. Which, I mean, how do you beat that? And you took Uncle Ray out hunting? I did take Ray hunting. He wanted to go hunting, so I organized him a hunting trip. And uh, you know, bless Ray, it, a, it was a good shot. I was, I was, I was sometimes thinking to myself, man, I don't know if this American can shoot so well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. But uh, you know, Ray, Ray's a good shot, and uh, you know, he got himself a blessed fork, which is a very nice animal. Yeah. And uh, we uh, we had a really good time out in the bush. We, we jumped in the plane. We flew out to the bush. And, uh, you know, we spent three days there and on the second day. So the, se- the first day we arrived, we hung out, we had a bra- we had a bry barbecue. And then the next morning in the early in the morning, we went out shooting. And then after, after the hunting, we, myself and Ray both shot and also Matthew shot an antelope. And, uh, you know, we're sitting there, what are we going to do for the rest of the day? So I had the bright thought, I'm just going to go visit my buddy Henning. My buddy Henning owns the, the, one of the largest crocodile farms in that area so we jumped in the plane off we went and we got to hang out we got to hang out with with you know there's seven thousand crocodiles on this farm you know that's insane on a math reading program and uh oh so we spent there had some time had some lunch there and then uh, the next day came back and i think ray shot another one i think if i can remember quickly i can't remember but anyway so we did that and then the next day we we, we flew back God, Ray must have loved that. Right I think Ray had fun. Oh, yeah. Well, you sent me the pictures uh, from the hunt itself, and I was so jealous because I'm like, that looks just uh, – of course they are. Of course they're yeah. hunting in Africa. Why would they not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, and then we made we, – what, really what, what really made Ray sour was that he couldn't take the meat with him. So we took <laughs> the meat back to Pretoria. <laughs> 
to get it all fixed up. You know, we made biltong and burrowos and <laughs> it was, it was, uh, the meat was just, but if you're, if you're watching this, Ray, you missed out, buddy. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> oh, good. there is nothing better than fresh biltong. Yes. There really isn't. When I, uh, when I did the safari with my daughter and my mom, we went, we did from, um, Jobu to, um, well, we went South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. And yeah. I think every time we stopped, I went in and found the next place that was selling fucking Biltong. And I lived off of Biltong in that van. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we were there for almost a month. We were, it was like a three and a half week safari. And it was, I, I think I was shitting Biltong for six months. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Loved it. Yeah. So you have another um, big event that you're um, building up to. Tell me about it. Yeah. So this one, it's um, it's I wouldn't say it's not as it's not as big as uh, as Shamwari, um, but uh, you know I have the ability to put sixty people in. I've got about fifteen twenty booked already, and uh, it's just just around the corner from my drop zone, literally in the airplane. It's just around the corner. Mm. And but it's a it's a four star lodge, and uh, we have a nice big landing area. Unfortunately, this one is a C license boogie, mm. um, because I, I wanted to make sure that it was as safe as possible. I didn't want people showing up uncurrent, you know, cup minimum jump numbers only have a B license, you know, or a couple hundred jumps. I mean, if you have four or five, six, seven hundred jumps, you're more than welcome to to approach me if you want to come. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's an all inclusive. The only thing I didn't include was, uh, was the, the alcohol that, mm. that I can't, because some people are just crazy. They drink all day, all night <laughs> and they don't jump so yep. rather, rather than jump. You know, we've got some amazing, amazing organizers. You know, we've got Amy Shemilecki, we have, we have Anna Marksness, we have Naomi Kutsia and then, uh, Mr. Johnson. So who's that's a crew Biden? right there, dude. That's a fucking, right? that's a rock star roster. Yeah. I mean, I have amazing organizers. I can't say enough good things about these people. They are, um, they're very well known all around the world. And, you know, I've known these people quite a while. Um, so I wanted to get my friends starting and starting to be involved. And my plan is to do more of these, um, types of boogies in South Africa. So I'm, I'm looking around for the, 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 the I wouldn't say that the cheaper, but the, the more of the bush experience, that's not going to cost a lot. Sure. You know, like this one, you've got five days, all inclusive. But what's actually awesome is before we start jumping, it's a, it's a public holiday on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And we're going to, it's got a full three days of jumping at the drop zone. So you can get used to the altitude in a nice safe, I'm not saying the other place is not safe, but I'm saying it's a nice green grass. Sure. There's not a dirt landing area, you know, but um, we, you know, it's going to be the first, those three days, then the five day boogie. And then um, you're going to have another two days on the weekend after that, to be able to jump more with these organizers. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So we try to try to try to get it all inclusive, which we have done nice runway and an an acceptable landing area um but we're going to go out there and obviously clean it up a little bit more before we start sure and then it's a five star we've got a, we've got swimming pools we've got hot tubs we've got massage therapists uh, we've got you know five star food um it's 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 an amazing place it's called mongana and it's how do you spell it so people can look it up m o n g e n a mongana mongana okay cool Awesome. Yeah, and you can you can find it all on uh, um, African uh, skydiving adventures. You, you sure about AFL. that? <laughs> African skydiving adventures. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Cool. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of work lately. You know, we we we're organizing. There's another boogie happening. It's called the Mzanzi boogie, which is happening in um, in in early March. Mm. This one is happening in at the end of March. So we got two back to back. The Mzanzi one is another one. That's coming in from Europe. We've got a group of uh, Dutch Dutchmen, Dutch people. Awesome. <laughs> coming in from Europe. Um, and yeah, so we've got a lot going on this year, this, this coming year. That's fantastic. 
Yeah. What now that time of year, what's the weather like? Perfect. Yeah. Is that yeah. that's the season? It's the spot. It's not too hot. What happens is early morning, when you wake up in the morning, it's a little bit chilly. Sure. Right? Perfect. Like, you know, and then throughout the day it gets hot. You can reach about 85, 90 degrees. And then at night it, it drops off. So if you are gonna come, I would say dress dress code would be short stuff for the day. And then evening time after, you know, evening time, early morning time is like with some warm clothes. Nice. Nice. You know, we're going to be doing safaris as you can with included in the, in the package is, is uh, three days of uh, safaris. Awesome. We got, we're going to go to monkey nastics and see all the monkeys. And then there's a beer tasting place just around the corner, which we're going to go and, you know, drink. Skydiving, safari, massages, swimming pools, and beer tasting and yes. skydivers. Correct. That sounds like a pretty good time. I've already I've already been given shit from uh, Naomi and Anna uh, that I better show up. So I'm trying to see how I can make it happen. I think you should show up because if you don't show up, you're never coming, you're never being invited back on this. Show, I, okay? I well, so ah. I I'm I have a bit. Well, no, that's in April. I'm I'm definitely it's 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 I'm trying for sure and in April. Well, in April, the wife and I are supposed to go to Nepal to try and summit uh, Island Peak. So that's already in the books. So we're going to do that. That's another thing you and I will have to talk about the next time we do this is our mutual experience going up to and back from Everest Base Camp. Yeah. Because yeah. you you made it. I did. Yeah, absolutely. No training, no training nothing. I just jumped on and off I went. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. I remember because I got messages from you and we talked about it because you were like, look, I'm in South Africa. I'm stopping off in Dubai and I'm going to Everest. What do I need to know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I got some shit for you. Take this stuff. <laughs> they told me you should, you should definitely have shoes that are worn in. You know that I bought a brand new pair of shoes the day before I left. Of course you did. And it was the best thing I ever did because they were actually, they weren't, they were tight on me. They weren't like they were like a size small almost. No blisters, no nothing. Really? Yeah. Nothing. Well, because uh, I you took my trekking poles, didn't you? I did. Yes. Because yeah, my trekking poles have now made uh, four trips to Everest because I've lent them out twice and then I've taken them twice. So my trekking poles and some of my equipment's been up there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, because last time I was up there with the. Uh, uh, a little bit of Micah, a little bit of Kevin Love, uh, a little bit of Zach Kimsey, fucking a little bit. Yeah, I know. A little bit of Matt Munting. All of them, <laughs> you know. Wow. There's some names right there, boy. Oh, tell me about it, man. And, of course, um, who but Kevin ends up uh, um, going on a gust of wind backdraft into my face. So I've I ah. fucking swallowed some of Kevin. <laughs> And all I could think, I'm shooting the video as I'm releasing the ashes, and I'm it's very dramatic, and I'm super emotional. And in the middle of it all, the ashes go slamming into my face, and all I can think is fucking Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> of <Got> course, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. I'm like, it's his last fucking, it's his last little laugh. He's getting, he's nailing me with that. It's funny because uh, uh, somewhere in here. Oh, you can't see it. It's off camera, but uh, I've got a, a necklace that uh, Janet sent me that actually has some of his ashes in the uh, pendant that's on the necklace. So he's sitting in the room too. So he's with us, hanging out. You know, Lost. as he'll do. <laughs> so hey, uh, before we we can do this all fucking night long, and and probably will anyway. But uh, before we uh, um, stop recording, tell them once again what's the uh, uh event what's the website what's the drop zone what's your contact information so people can reach out book shit come to a jump find out when the next competition is yeah, all that uh, stuff the, 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 the whole thing has been put on by osac aviation and it's osacc aviation at gmail.com so if you want to you know when any other information just reach up there <laughs> we are on instagram we are on uh, on facebook african skydiving adventures um and like i said this is not going to be this is not going to be the only one we're going to do multiple so you know we're going to invite everyone from all over the world the dubai people should come we're going to put one in this in the, in the dubai summer nice it's gonna be, that's going to be cold but not like freezing like snow what like what you're dealing with with uh yeah buddy skydive pretoria is the drop <laughs> starting at yeah and then 
you know, when we jump in a, in a bus that gives us about a 45 minute drive from the drop zone, it's going to be, uh, everything's going to be available on the bus. I'm going to put a nice big X esky cooler box, you know, a couple. So there going to be a stripper pole? Uh, and only, only if you come and put it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a deal. That's a deal. Yeah. There's, there's three, there's three different packages. There is the, uh, the, the non-jumper package, you know, and then there's obviously the skydiver package. And then we have for an extra 200 euros, we have a package. There's only f- four or five, uh, these luxury glamping tents and they are right on this lake and inside the lake are crocodile hippos. So at night when you go to bed, you don't come outside. <laughs> yeah, and there's lion on the farm. So there's lion, there's, bird, there's pretty much the whole big five. If you don't Which, know what the big five is? Go, go look it up. Yeah, uh, it's so impressive. Yeah, and then I, you know no, you've go, got we've, we've got no. vehicles uh, for each each campsite. We've got vehicles, um, and then we have a massive party at the end of the time at the end of the trip on the Friday night. Saturday morning we're back to the drop zone. You do some more jumps if you want. And then after that, happy days. Travel down to Cape Town, go see Cape Town, make like a two, three, three week adventure out of it. Hell yeah. Know? Hell yeah. I tried to get the pricing down as much as I could. The uh, the the top level price is 4,000 euros, all inclusive for five days. Um, and then the, the skydiving one is uh, 3,800 euros. And then the one just below that is the non skydiver. And that is for. Um, what three thousand six hundred euros? Cool. I mean the the luxury one with the the glamping tent. Fuck, we did that uh, um, in a place called Hyena Pen in Botswana. Have <laughs> you been? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. So <laughs> I'm there at Hyena Pen. We're in that glamping tent, and they've given us the briefing. They're like, "Hey, once the sun goes down, we'll walk you to after dinner and everything. We'll walk you to your tent and then stay there." You know, you got the bathroom and everything inside. You don't go outside wandering around on your own. We're like, okay, no problem. Well, the first night they walk us and everything. And the second night, the staff is just like, okay, good night. Have a good night. And like kind of showing us the path. And so I, my daughter and I shared one of the tents. We go down. It's no big deal. Whatever. We get there. We're kind of looking and listening and there's nothing happening. We get in the tent, close the door, brushing our teeth and everything. And we're laying in these two massive queen size beds. She's on one side of the tent. I'm on the other side reading a book. And all of a sudden outside the tent, you hear this sniffing and (laughs) sniffing, circling the fucking tents. And both of us are like, that's fucking hyenas. (laughs) And your little butthole goes like this. Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah and you're just i'm laying under it's the strangest thing in the world to be laying in a queen size bed with this beautiful duvet and soft pillows and you're just holding the blanket over you going there's a fucking hyena on the other side of that canvas right there <laughs> <laughs> well wait, you know one day you wake up and the next morning you open the tent and you're right next to the tent you see uh hippopotamus footprints <laughs> And you know, and and you don't even hear it. Like you don't have no idea it was there. Yep, yep, yep. Well, the elephants are the same way. I mean, you just don't hear them. They're just no. they're they just appear. <laughs> anyway, hey, we can do this all night long. We'll we'll have to save it for next time around. Billy, as always, amazing catching up with you. Uh, I cannot wait to see how this event uh, uh, comes together and see everything from it, whether I'm there live or whether I get to see the pictures. But for yeah. anybody that's interested, African skydiving adventures. Yes. Look and it don't, up. don't forget old uh, Sean Robinson's coming to do all the pictures. Outside video, ultra pictures, amazing day tapes all day every day. Amazing. So we've got a star, star studded uh, class of organizers, videographers, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be one for the books. Well, I mean, shit, the organizers alone should make people go anywhere, but to be able to go someplace like that, fucking fantastic. Yeah, exactly. All right, brother. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it, man. Much love. Take care, brother. We'll see you soon. Ciao.
Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by... Well, wait. Not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as Enziero Sports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the extreme sports collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems... Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.